work there. So, all right, well, let's get to tonight. We have been talking about no hope, uh, question mark. Uh, it is a tactic of Satan uh, to get us to lose hope, uh, to give up, and just say, well, there's nothing I can do about it. And we looked early on in basically saying there is no hope for sinners. You know, you sin, there's no hope for you. But we know that's not true, is it? <laughs> it really doesn't matter what you have done. Is there still hope through the blood of Jesus Christ? Can you be set free? Can you be forgiven of what you have done? And we saw Adam and Eve. Were Adam and Eve forgiven? Oh, there's consequences, but they were forgiven. Even Cain, God showed mercy on him. And even Peter denied him three times. It doesn't matter the sin. There's no, no situation where there is no hope because there's always hope in Jesus Christ. And we can look at the world and say, well, there's no hope for this world. But is that true? No, there's hope. The word's still going out. There's still Christians. There's still that hope of nations and people and the whole world even repenting and turning to God. We need to keep getting that message out there, don't we? And letting them know that. And what about for this country? Is there no hope for this country? Well, of course not. There, <laughs> there is hope, isn't there? There's hope for this country. If there is hope for Nineveh, is there hope for us? <laughs> yes. Any country can turn to the Lord, can't they? And we need to make sure we understand that and keep getting out there, keep spreading the gospel, keep telling people about the hope that we have in God. Then we looked at kind of things. So we looked at the power of sin. We're all enslaved by the power of sin. But is there hope? Again, what does Satan want us to say? Oh, well, I'm just enslaved to sin. That's just the way God made me. There's nothing I can do about it. It has power over me. That's just the way it is. But is that the way it is? Can God break the power of sin in our life? We can't, but he can, right? And we need to turn to him and say, Lord, please free me from this. And it doesn't matter what enslaves us. He can free us, can he? And what about obstacles? Last week we looked at obstacles, especially the people of Israel as they came out from being enslaved. God set them free. And what was the first obstacle they ran into? Something called the Red Sea. God led them there. God had a plan for leading them there, a great plan for leading them there. But what was their first thought? There's no hope. <laughs> There's no hope. They're coming to kill us. We're stopped here. There's no way across. Why'd you bring us out here to die? And there is no hope. But was there hope? There's always hope in God in there. And if he's brought you to it, he will get you through it, right? And he got them through that. And they, even when they got to the promised land, what was their thought? There is no hope. We can't take those walled cities. We can't take those giants. We can't get through that obstacle. Let's go back to Egypt. Crazy, isn't it? But how many times do we do that? Where God has led me, the obstacles are too big. The challenges are too hard. I can't do it. And you know what? That's true, but with God, can we? With God, what is possible? All things are possible. So no matter what the obstacle is, no, if God has brought it to you to it, he knows how to get through it and to the other side, and we'll be stronger for it, won't we? Well, tonight we're going to look at need. In fact, everybody please go to Exodus chapter 15. And we're actually going to stick with, why not? Stick with the children of Israel as they're coming out of Egypt. And there are times in life where our needs just seem too great. And that there is no way, there is no hope for meeting the need that we have. Whether it is a physical need, spiritual need, mental need, spirit, whatever the need is, Satan's going to be sitting there saying, God doesn't care about you anymore. <laughs> you might as well give up. You're never going to get what you need. Just lay down and die, right? And we need to understand that, no, can God meet our need? Let's start there. Can God meet our need? Absolutely. Will God meet our need? Absolutely. And we have to keep that in mind. We're going to see that in these stories tonight. Let's go to Exodus chapter 15. We're going to start in verse 22. So they have passed through the Red Sea. God has overcome that obstacle. They are very excited. They saw the power of God as they walked 
across on dry land, reached the other side, and then saw the power of God as Pharaoh and his army got stuck and then drowned. As God said before they even stepped across it, what? You will never see them again. <laughs> God's got it all under control. And as they're leaving there, what happens? Verse 22 of Exodus 15. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Is that a problem? Oh, yes. <laughs> Yeah, you and me, it's like, oh, there's no water. What's our response? I will go get some, right? I can go find some water. I can get some water. But when you're in the middle of the wilderness and you have about a one million people plus cattle and you have no water and you've been searching for water for three days, there are no 7-Elevens. There are no Safeways. There's no Amazon to order quickly overnight delivery of tons of water. There's no way to get water, and there's no water to be found until they looked over the horizon and they saw water. Ah, oh, we are saved. But, verse 23, And when they came to Mara, they could not drink of the waters of Mara, for they were bitter. By the way, what does Mara mean? bitter. <laughs> That's what it means. So if you ever go to a place and it says, we have Mara water, don't drink it. It is not good for you. Either it was salt or it was poisonous. I mean, it could mean either one. And it was bitter, and they could not drink it. Therefore, the name of the place is called Mara. Verse 24. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? So when we have a need, and it doesn't seem like it can be fulfilled what is our natural human reaction yeah, complain <laughs> wine right why have you brought us here we have no water who's in charge here who is in charge there don't say moses god is who's the one leading them with a cloud by day and a fire by night who has led them to this place who has led you where you're at and if god has led you there does he know what you need does he know you're a physical human being? Does he know everything about you and what you need? Yes. And if he does, does he know how to fix the problem? Yes, he does. But instead, they decided to complain. And complain to Moses. By the way, what should be our first response when we see we have a need? Go to God and ask. <laughs> ask, right? Goes back to my favorite thing with my kids. None of them are here right now. Excellent. <laughs> they would come say, I'm thirsty. And what would my response be? Good for you. <laughs> what I didn't hear there was, hear a what? An ask. <laughs> May I have a cup of water? Absolutely. I'm thirsty means nothing to me. So you have to learn to ask. And this is important in our relationship with God. We need to ask and not just expect him to do everything, right? When we have a need, we need to go to him. Instead, they just said, let's complain to Moses. Verse 25, and Moses cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. So he said, hey, Moses, here's a tree. Take that tree, throw it in the water, and all the water will now become drinkable. Is that science? That's actually not science. There's, there's no tree in the world that you can throw into and make it sweet. Where it can, from poisonous or salt, it doesn't work that way. Who's working? Can God fix the problem? Can he fix it in a way that we could never comprehend? In fact, they could have worked day and night trying to make that good water and never been able to do it. In fact, they could have left that place and said, let's go find some water and not found it. But God said what? Stay here and I will fix it my way. And he did. Verse 26. And said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. Just a little reminder here, folks, to them. <laughs> Who's in charge here? Do you remember what I did to the Egyptians? If I can do that, can I take care of you? 
in our life, what should we always remember? If God is willing to die on the cross for our sins, what will he do for us? Can he meet any need? If he can meet that paramount need of salvation by his great love and sacrifice, can he meet any other need as well? And will he? Does he love us enough to do so? Don't forget verse 27, though. A lot of times we stop there because that's kind of the end of that story, but don't miss 27. And they came to Elam, where were 12 wells of water and three score and ten palm trees, and they had camped there by the waters. Did he leave them in the place of need? See, that's the thing. God will bring us, and we will have times of need, and we will ask him, and he will meet us, but then he will take us sometimes to places where we have no need. He will give us blessing, right? And what should we do then when he brings us to the place of blessing? Thank you. <laughs> That's right. Be thankful and appreciative. We don't have to go through that again. And he brought them to a lush place where they could camp and relax. So test number one, how did they do? Bad. But they're going to learn, right? See, that's the thing. Again, <laughs> just a reminder to everybody. It's good and best to learn from other people's mistakes, right? Learn from other people's That's awesome. Second best thing is to learn from your own mistakes. The worst thing you can do is never learn from your own mistakes, right? <laughs> and which one are we going to find here? Let's find out. Let's go to the next one, Exodus chapter 16. Yes, it is only the next chapter. <laughs> so God has proven, I can meet your need. I will provide the water. I know you need water. I will provide. But when we get to chapter 16, verse 1, and they took their journey from Elam, so where that nice place with all the water and everything, and all the congregation of children of Israel came unto the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, which is where they're headed, on the 15th day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. So they haven't been that long out of Egypt, have they? So they're traveling along. Verse 2. And the whole congregation of children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. They have another complaint. You need water. What's the other thing you need? Food. <laughs> Again, does God know these things? Is God looking down on us and saying, I had no idea they needed food. I had no idea they needed water. Boy, this is a shocker to me. God knows everything we need. He knows what's coming up. He has everything under control. He already had a plan, didn't he? But instead, instead of, oh, wait a minute, last time we needed water, we should have just asked. We need food now, so let's what? Eh, no. <laughs> no. They complain, and they murmur, and talk. Verse 3, And the children of Israel said unto them, unto Aaron and Moses, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and we did eat bread <coughs> to the full. For you have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. That goes beyond murmuring, doesn't it? That's just flat out ungrateful. I wish I was in slavery again. Because then I could eat those flesh pots. And I could just die there a slave rather than out here free and die here. They're making a big mistake though, aren't they? Did God bring them here to die? In fact, he told them why, where he was taking them. I'm taking you to the promised land. I'm taking you to a place of milk and honey. I'm going to take you where you need to be, right? Of blessing. But they don't believe him, do they? Verse 4, Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day, that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or not. I will provide. Every morning when they wake up, there will be bread on the ground. Again, science? No. <laughs> Miracle. It'll just be out there, a little honey bread. Every day, every morning they go out, there will be bread. And they will take enough for them and their family for that day. And the next day, what will be out there again? Same thing, except on the Sabbath day. And he'll provide a double amount the day before the Sabbath on Friday. And then they can have it one day and the next. Don't take more than you're supposed to. Don't hoard it. Don't be like the guys with toilet paper. 
and the pandemic, just hoarding it into yourself and saying you're going to hold next day because that was the funny thing. If it stayed overnight, it just molded. <laughs> it just disintegrated. It was disgusting. Except on the Sabbath. <laughs> that one lasted two days. Is God completely in control here? He not only said that, but he said, oh, by the way, I'm going to send you some flesh. I'm going to send some quails. I'm just going to send some quails in there too. But, make note, people, is God happy with them? Is he happy with the murmuring? He will provide, but do you really want to make them mad? <laughs> what should they have done? When they ran out of water, what should they have done? Please, Lord, we need water. And when they ran out of food, what should they have done? Lord, please, we need some bread. And then taken what he provided and been thankful. How much better would this journey have been if they just would have learned that? Because did they learn? They ran out of water again. Chapter 17. Yes. Only chapter 17. We're not even at Sinai yet. <sighs> they even finished the first leg of their trip. They've already got problems. Chapter 17, verse 1. And all the congregation of children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. So again, keep in mind, who is leading them all along the way? God. And is, does he know that there's no water in Rephidim? Yes. <laughs> he knows there's not a river there. He knows there's not a well there. He knows there's not something dug already or a lake or anything like that. He knows there's nothing there that you can see, right? But he's got a plan because he's leading. How many of you are being led by the Lord? <laughs> and when you have need, does he know you're going to have that need and he's already have a plan? So what should they do? What should they do right here and now? Look around. No water. Lord, please. Provide water as you have before. We're so thankful you're watching over us and leading us here. And what would God have done? Water. Instead, verse 2, Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. That's very nice, isn't it? Such a polite people. <laughs> and Moses said unto them, Why chide you with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? Why are you trying the Lord? What? Have you learned nothing, people? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? Bad attitude. Does God love you or not? Does God care about you or not? So why are they worried? They don't believe him. They don't trust him. They should He's proven himself over and over again, but still not doing it. Verse 4. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, What shall I do unto this people? They be almost ready to stone me. And that's not the first time or the last time. <laughs> uh, he's the object of their ridicule right now. Verse 5. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people, and take with thee of the elders of Israel, and thy rod, wherewith thou smotest the river, take it in thine hand, and go. Behold, I will stand before thee there upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel, and he called the name of that place Massa and Meribah, because of the chiding of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? And that's the question, isn't it? When we challenge God, when we claim that God does not care, when we say that there is no hope because we have a need and it's not being fulfilled when we want and how we want, basically we're questioning whether God loves us. We're questioning whether God is with us, whether he is on our side. And what sh we should know the answers to those, shouldn't we? Should they have known the answer to that? <laughs> yeah, they should know because, remember, he brought them out of Egypt. He got them through the Red Sea. He's already provided water once. He gives them food every day. Should know he's on their side. Do you know God is on your side? So why do we challenge? Why do we worry? Why do we fret? Why do... <laughs> Why do we, instead of just what? Go to the Lord and ask. And will he provide our needs? And sometimes in miraculous ways.
Just go over to that rock, hit it with a stick, and water's going to come pouring out enough to feed, give water to everybody and the cattle and everything you have, and they will have plenty. Does God know what he's doing? Yes, he does. And the people learned to never challenge God again. Nope. Let's go to Numbers. So this is after Sinai, where, of course, they got the Ten Commandments and they did the whole uh, golden calf thing, which is another dumb thing. But, but as they travel along, and I want you to keep in mind that here in the book of Numbers, these two passages, where should the people be? instead of out in the desert at this point. They should be in the promised land. They should be in the land of milk and honey. They should be taking fruits from the vineyards that they did not have to plant, the trees they did not have to plant, sitting in cities that they did not have to build. They should be there. Instead, they're out in the desert. Why? Because they did not trust God. They did not think that he could get past those obstacles, right? So it's their own fault they're out here, but is God still with them? Does God still care? Does God still have their best interest in mind? Yes, he does. And here in Numbers chapter 11, we're going to start in verse 4. And the mixed multitude that was among them fell a-lusting. Now, when you see that, you automatically think, oh, after women or people of other lands or things like that. That's not. It's lusting for something that you don't have. Basically, the problem here is God was providing something called manna. And God provides for us. But sometimes in our human heart, we say, what God is providing is not enough. I want more. Now, let me ask you something. Is it okay to ask God for more? Yeah, 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 yes. But if he says no, be what? (laughs) Be content with what you have. And do it with a good attitude, right? Not a, hey, they have that. Why don't we have this? Things like that. Be happy with what you have. If you do have a desire for more, ask them, and he could say no. Instead, they decided to do what? They went back to their old playbook and said, let's murmur. (laughs) Let's complain. The bread is not enough. And again, They shouldn't be eating manna at this point. (laughs) It's their own fault they're still eating manna. But let's face it, 40 years of eating manna, how many get a little tired of it? If you had to eat the same thing every day for 40 years, I don't care how you prepare it. (laughs) It does not matter. You're going to get tired of it. And again, I don't think the problem is that they had a desire for something else, some meat or something. The problem's in the heart, isn't it? And they went a lusting, and the children of Israel also wept again and said, Who shall give us flesh to eat? We want some meat. And we remember, here's the problem. <clears throat> what were they actually lusting for? We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic, but now our soul is dried away. There is nothing at all beside this manna before our eyes. So they at once laud their slavery again and their enslavement back in the ways of the world at the same time basically minimalize and say what God has given us is garbage is that the right attitude not that's called lusting (laughs) lusting for the things of the world right so what happens verse 10 jump down to verse 10 numbers chapter 11 verse 10 then Moses heard the people weep through a out their families, every man in the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord was kindled greatly. Moses also was displeased. So as he's walking around the camp, all he hears is everybody whining and crying about how they don't have any meat. What doesn't he hear? Praying. (laughs) Doesn't he hear people lifting up their voice in praise and thanksgiving to God and asking for some meat? All he hears is whining and complaining. And how irritating is that when all you ever hear is whining and complaining? Every parent out here knows what that's like. (laughs) It gets irritating after a while, doesn't it? Verse 11, And Moses said unto the Lord, Wherefore hast thou afflicted thy servant? What have you done to me? And wherefore have I not found favor in thy sight that thou layest the burden of all this people upon me? He's feeling it. 
Have I conceived all these people? Are they my children? Am I responsible for these children? Have I begotten them that thou shouldest say unto me, Carry them in thy bosom as a nursing father beareth the sucking child uh, unto the land which thou swearest unto their fathers? That is a very strange statement, though, when you think about it. I don't know very many nursing fathers. But you get the idea. <laughs> Verse 13. When should I have flesh to give unto all this people? For they weep unto me, saying, Give us flesh that we may eat. There is nothing I can do about it. And here's where Moses makes a mistake. Because he's sitting there saying, and in his mind, I don't have the ability to give them flesh. And he's feeling the pressure of he has to fulfill this. He has to solve the problem. But who is the one that has to solve the problem? Who's the one that can solve the problem? God. So he's doing a little complaining himself here. Verse 14. I am not able to bear all this people alone because it is too heavy for me. And if thou deal thus with me, kill me. Even Moses has what? Lost hope. I can't go on like this. Them always complaining, always coming on me. I can't fix the problem. Again, he's forgetting who he's talking to. He needs to, to, to also go to the one, and not to complain, but to come and seek his help to solve the problem, to change the hearts of the people, or give them flesh, or do something, right? So what happens? Verse 18. Jump down to verse 18. So God tells Moses, in verse 18, to say unto the people, Sanctify yourselves again tomorrow, and you shall eat flesh. So get yourself cleaned up. Stop your whining and complaining. Get, get ready, because tomorrow you're going to have flesh to eat. For you have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Who shall give us flesh to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you flesh, and you shall eat. How many have ever had a situation where you get what you asked for and it's not what you wanted? This is about to happen. And God sometimes will say, okay. Like, you know, think of it like when somebody says, I wish it would rain. How come God doesn't make it rain? It needs to rain more. And then it floods. <laughs> All right? Don't complain. Because sometimes he'll give you exactly what you want. In fact, look what he says. Verse 19. You shall not eat one day, nor two days, nor five days, neither ten days nor twenty days, but even a whole month until you come out of your nostrils, and it shall be loathsome unto you, because that you have despised the Lord which is among you, and have wept before him, saying, Why came we forth out of Egypt? You want meat? I'll give you meat. You're going to eat meat until you're sick of it. That's all you're going to have for the next month. And by the way, does meat keep? <laughs> it does not. So, and Moses said to the people, verse 21, The people among whom I am are 600,000 footmen, and thou hast said, I will give them flesh, that they may eat a whole month. Shall the flocks and the herds be slain for them to suffice them? Or shall all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to suffice them? Again, Moses is saying, how can I fulfill this? How can it happen? We need to trust who? Trust the Lord. Did, did God have a plan? And boy, did he have a plan. Verse 23, And the Lord said unto Moses, Is the Lord's hand waxed short? Is God unable? Is he weak? Is there anything he can't do? You want meat? Okay. He could have had a herd of zebras there. It doesn't matter. Could have had a big elephant. Could have had whales just come from the sky. It doesn't matter. <laughs> He'll take care of it. Thou shalt see now whether my word shall come to pass unto thee or not. Jump down to verse 31. Numbers chapter 11, verse 31. So he tells the people that, get ready, meat is coming. You complained about it, it's coming. You're going to have it for a month. Get out your recipe books. Verse 31, And there went forth a wind from the Lord, and brought quails from the sea, and let them fall by the camp, as it were a day's journey on this side, and as it were a day's journey on the other side. So if you think of the camp... And how far you could walk, there were enough quail 
covering a day's journey this way and a day's journey that way. However you went, there was what? Quail. That's a lot of quail. I don't know where. It came from the sea. <laughs> and as it were, a day's journey on the other side, round about the camp, as it were, two cubits high upon the face of the earth. Now, some, some say, that's three feet, by the way. It's about three feet tall. Now, some say it was quail three feet high. Others say it was three feet high flying around. So basically it was quail. Have you ever seen quail? They don't fly very high. So basically it was them flying around about three feet off the ground everywhere they went. So you went out. How many have ever had the cicadas? The swarm of cicadas where they're just everywhere, flying all around, running into them. We had one of those in Bakersfield where I'm from. <coughs> we had a, a year of crickets. Crickets were everywhere. Anywhere you want driving over them, running over them, flying in your windshield constantly. It was just crickets everywhere. Think of that, a swarm of bugs, except it's quail. And wherever you went, they were flying around, and, you were, and they were grabbing them up, and they were eating them as fast as they could for a month. And they got sick of it. Verse 32. And the people stood up all that day and all that night and all the next day, and they gathered the quails. He that gathered least gathered ten homers. Anybody know how big a homer is? 86 gallons. So the least gathered was 860 gallons of quail. <laughs> That's a lot of quail. I look at that and say, how are there any quail left in this world? <laughs> they make them extinct. That's a lot of quail. And they spread them all abroad for themselves round about the camp. And while the flesh was yet between their teeth, ere it was chewed, the wrath of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord smote the people with very great plague. You're going to be sick of it, and you're going to get sick from it. Be careful what you ask for. More importantly... Be careful how you ask. That you ask with thanksgiving, you ask with well intention, with gratitude for all that he's done. Has he done this before? Yeah, he's done the quail thing before. He did it the first time, but it wasn't a month worth and it didn't make him sick, right? He could have just asked and he could have brought quail. He could have brought, brought anything. He could have brought steaks. I mean, whatever they needed. Lambs. <laughs> he could have brought anything unto them to feed them. He did quail and then made him sick. So we have to be careful. Never lose hope. God can do it. Just trust him. Know that he's with you. And finally, Numbers chapter 20, just to cap the whole thing. Guess what they ran out of again? Since we're going water, food, water, food. Guess what the next one is? Water again. But this time they got it, right? They've been through this twice. They've got it, right? Chapter 20, verse 1. Then came the children of Israel, even the whole congregation, into the desert of Zin. Not Sin, Zin. In the first month, and the people abode in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Not pertinent to the story, but his sister died there. And there was no water for the congregation. They gathered themselves together again against Moses and against Aaron. So again, their response was what? Moses' fault, Aaron's fault, Right? Complain, complain, complain. The people chode with Moses and spake, saying, Would God that we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. So we would have died, and there was rebellion before this, and others, we, we should have died. I wish we would have died earlier in the desert than have to deal with thirsting to death. Verse 4, And why have you brought up the congregation of the Lord into this wilderness that we and our cattle should die there. And wherefore hast thou made us to come up out of Egypt to bring us unto this evil place? It is no place of seed or of figs or of vines or of pomegranates, neither is there any water to drink. And again, keep in mind, there was a place like that. They were supposed to be in there, but they did not trust God to overcome that obstacle. <laughs> so it's their fault they're there, but will God still provide? Verse 6, And Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. They fell upon their faces, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto them. They went to the Lord, and they asked for help, and God said, I want you to go over to the rocks, take the staff, 
Do not hit the rocks like last time. Just pass it over, and water's going to come gushing out. Now, you know the story. He went and struck him anyways. <laughs> he hit him twice, angry. For that, he was not able to go into the promised land. But still, was, did God have a plan already? If he's brought them there, he knows they have a need, he already knows the way. They just need to trust him. And they did not learn. There's not a single time that we are given in the Bible, in this account, not a single time they ran out of water and they trusted the Lord just prayed. Not a single time. Why? Well, we can ask ourselves the same thing, can't we? When we have a need, why don't we go to the Lord? Why don't we just take it to him? When we have a worry, when we have a fear, when we feel overwhelmed, when we feel like there's no hope, there's no way out of it, I have this need that can never be taken care of, why don't we go to the Lord? Why don't we realize how much he loves us? Why don't we realize how powerful he is and know he's on our side and not question it for a moment and let him in the right time, in the right way, provide for that need? In fact, let's get to just three quick keys to all of this. Let's go to James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verse 1. James chapter 4, verse 1. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Well, what, 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 why does all this stuff go on in this world that we're constantly fighting and wanting? And Well, it's because we have needs, or perceived needs at least, and we try to fulfill them ourselves. Come they not hence even of your lusts? That war in your members, you lust and have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not because you what? Ask not. We go through these periods where we lose hope. We go through these periods of fear. We go through these periods of fighting and hating and doing all this because we have a need and it's not being fulfilled and we go through and we have these all these negative human reactions to it because we simply don't go to the one who is the source of all good things and say lord please i thank you for everything you have done for me and i know you'll take care of this lord i wait on you i will be still and know that you are lord you are god and I know you'll take care of it. Then you find what? Peace and hope that the world could never understand. They're still out there fighting, aren't they? <laughs> They're still out there beating each other up, trying to, trying to get more, trying to get things they need, right? When we have the one, creator of all things, and we can go before the, his throne at any time and find grace to help in time of need, don't we? So we need to go and humbly ask. We also need to do this. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. And here Paul is talking to the uh, church there in Philippi. And he's writing them and thanking them for their gift for him. Uh, they were very generous. But he wants to make sure he understands that he isn't in this job <laughs> as minister, as, as an evangelist, as a planter of churches for the money. He knows God will always take care of him. In fact, he says in verse 11, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be what? Content. Contentment is a wonderful thing, isn't it? No matter what situation I'm in. In fact, he says, verse 12, I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. It doesn't matter. If I have a great need, I know God's going to take care of it, and I will give him all the glory. If I have more and I am blessed, I will be thankful to God. For what he has provided. And I will be content either way. In fact he makes his famous statement in verse 13. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I can do any situation. It doesn't matter. If it's a health need. Financial need. Relationship need. Spiritual need. Mental need. It doesn't matter. I can do it all. If God wants me there in that situation. 
I will be patient and let him take care of it in the right time, in the right way, right amount, right? And be content with whatever he has me going through. In fact, one last place, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, last place tonight. Let your conversation, that's your way of living, your daily walk of life, let your conversation be without covetousness. That was the problem with Israel, wasn't it, when it came to the meat. They lusted for the old way. They lusted for the ways of the world. How many times did Israel do that? They lusted for a king. They lusted for the things that the world had. We lust for money. We lust for power, for this, for that. He says, no, no. Don't covet the things of the world. Don't covet the things of your neighbors. Don't covet things you don't have. And be instead content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And that's the key. The key to the contentment is remembering who's with you. And all good things come from him, right? And they always come at the right time. Trust him. As he said of Israel, basically you're challenging whether I love you or not, whether I'm on your side or not, whether I'm with you or not. God is with us, isn't he? Every step of the way. He's there before we even get there. (laughs) Right? He knows every point of need we're ever going to have he already knows how he's going to take care of it he's just expecting us to say if you brought me here lord i'm content to be here and lord if you will please just take care of my need and however you will do it i trust you and will he and how much a better trip that would have been i would say man the israelites could have had a nice two and a half year journey having every need met every enemy defeated having received the word of God and just walked right into the promised land, (laughs) it would have been great. How much harder do we make our own journey when we just don't trust the Lord and just know that he will take care of our needs? How many anxious nights, how much weeping, how much irritation, how much better the trip would have been for Moses? I have to remember, he's 80 years old having to deal with all that stuff. That's rough. Derek, you had a comment? Yeah, it's the same lie from the very beginning. He got basically Adam and Eve to lust for something. To lust for, to be like God. To know good from evil. And we know how that turned out. (laughs) That's not a good thing, was it? God doesn't want us to have it. It's not good for us. God wants us to have it. It's good for us. That goes every way imaginable. (laughs) So trust the Lord. He is with you. He will never leave us or forsake us. He will meet our needs. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. We know that, don't we? Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. We have enough, don't we? My God shall supply all your need. It's his promise, not mine. This is from me. (laughs) This is God saying it. Trust him each and every day. We know we can. Let's pray.